Amen, amen. Let's turn our Bibles to James chapter 5. James chapter 5. As we hop back into this epistle this week. Next week we'll be focusing on Father's Day, Lord willing, and then two weeks from today we'll continue our time through James as we look at suffering for the gospel. But today we want to talk about this matter of wealth. This is the concern that James keeps coming back to, and it's one in which we want to be careful to not ignore. James 5, I want to read verses 1 through 12, and then we'll focus in on verses 1 through 6 in our time together. This is God's precious word. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remained steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the, the very comforting reality that you indeed are a compassionate and merciful God, and that nothing goes by you. You are omnipresent. You are omniscient. You know all things. And you are omnibenevolent. You know you are all good. So, Lord, we, we ask for your help now as we seek to understand what your, your earthly brother James, through the Spirit, has to say for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. James, in this next section, is continuing on with the practical application of the categories of his great concern, particularly his concern of money. The problem is not that money is the problem. The issue, the matter before us, is this matter of the love of money. Is money sinful? Is being rich sinful? Is being middle class sinful? Is it a virtue to be poor? We can go on with questions like that, and there are many in our day and age who will try to <clears throat> twist and turn and demonize those who work hard in a society like ours, and benefit greatly. For the third time, though, James is concerned about wealth. If you go to James chapter 1, notice here in verses 9 through 11, he says, Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation because like a flower of the grass he will pass away, for the sun rises with its scorching heat 
and withers the grass, its flower falls, and its beauty perishes, so also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Elsewhere, in chapter 2, we don't want to miss this one as well. In chapter 2, in dealing particularly in verse, verses 5 and, and really through 7, he says, Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor, the poor man, and are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? Now, obviously, this is not talking about godly rich people. This is referring to the ungodly rich. In this context, the Jews who made it part of their very existence to harass and grieve believers and try to dis disrupt their lives. Now, the Bible talks a lot about money. We have to admit this. And therefore, it talks about earning. It talks about spending, how we spend our saving or not saving, giving, investing. It also talks about wasting money and also the danger of loving money. Here's one of the classic texts. In Matthew 6, 24, it says this, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You can't serve God and money. And then also in Hebrews 13, 5, it says this, Keep your life free from the love of money. And be content with what you have. So you can be content with whatever amount God has given you. You can be rich and be content. You can be middle class and be content. You can be poor and be content. You can be thankful in all things. You can work hard and do the best you can to honor God. But what drives you in your pursuit of wealth? Have you ever thought about that? Why do we work? We work to provide for our families. Why else? Is it to become rich? Is it a right motive to work to be rich? These are powerful questions. Our society is driven by people who want to be rich. And then they also promote envy as a legitimate excuse to say, it's not fair, I don't have what he or she has even though the fact may be that they worked very, very hard for that with right motives. Now he's talking again about these crucial, this crucial area of money, but what else is he talking about? Already in chapter one we've seen he's talked about life is full of trials. Are we gonna persevere in our, through our trials? Are we going to mature and grow through our trials? Or are we going to grumble when trials come and push away the maturity that God intended him for us. He tells us to pray for wisdom. He calls us in chapter one further to realize not just that wealth is fading, it's completely passing away. It's for this life alone, and if managed right, could be a great blessing, and if given too much credence, could be destruction of your soul. Chapter two, he he doesn't stop. If I just already read this about the issue of partiality. You know, some churches have in their mind, their mind, we want to reach a certain type of people. I've mentioned this before, but you know, some churches have a focus. I want to reach cowboys. I've actually seen that on the internet. The cowboy church. I want to read, I want to reach the bikers. I want to reach the up and outers. I want to reach youth. I want to reach millennials. But the Bible tells us to offer the gospel to all people everywhere. It calls us to welcome whatever complexion God creates within us. Amen? Amen. 
I wasn't calling for a affirming amen. God calls us to preach the word and let him create the church between the four walls of where you worship. But if we aim to be partial to certain types of people, people with money, lots of money, or another type of people that have a certain type of ilk, it becomes problematic. And this is what was happening in this, in this church. They were, remember in chapter one of James, there, there, there's the 12 tribes, Jewish tribes, represented dispersed amongst Asia Minor. They're out there, they're being persecuted, challenges are facing, being faced constantly, and this issue, again, of, of fighting off the conflict of those who would seek to follow an ungodly approach of the local church. James keeps going back to the practical implications. Guard your tongue. Twice he talks about that. He talks about being quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. He tells us to watch out for temptation because temptation comes to our wicked hearts. Our wicked hearts, if they don't mortify it, then our hearts fall into sin. And if not dealt with, sin leads to damnation. Death. We saw that every practical, every good gift is from above. We saw that we're to be doers of the word. We saw that we're not to have demon faith, but to have a faith that actually works. We're told to have the wisdom from above in James 3. In James 4, we're reminded to not be friends with the world, but to be a friend of God like Abraham. To beware of the war within, the assault on our minds by the evil one. To draw near to God because he'll draw near to us. And to not be anxious and boast about tomorrow, as we saw in our time together last. See, when, when he's referring to this idea of boasting about tomorrow, if you look at the context here, notice in verse 13 of James 4, the same two words that begin chapter 5, verse 1. Come now. Come now, you who say, verse 13, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such as a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it for him, it is sin. Come now, you rich. He's talking about rich merchants with businesses, therefore going to the end of the known world and presuming they'll have these riches, this success will continue to follow them, and that will be their normal lot in life. But they're boasting about tomorrow, and they may not have tomorrow. Don't put your weight in what is fading and your contentment in that. So he goes back to that theme of warning in our section today. And what we're going to see in the weeks ahead are is the suffering, the perseverance of, in suffering, the prayer of a righteous man availing much, and then lastly, a call which is powerful. The last two verses of James 5 and the end of the whole epistle, I've labeled it, a call to evangelize the church. James is very practical. But back to the issue of money. It says in 1 Timothy 5, 8, that if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially the members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Think about that. So hard work, gaining a, a more, more of an in income, call it what you want, middle class wealth in our day and age, if that's your driving motive, 
is to provide for your relatives, immediate, especially the members of your household, which means your extended family and your family. And then it says you've denied the faith if that's not your motive. And you're worse than unbeliever. So the Bible's against laziness and is pro hard work and wisdom from above and generosity and sacrifice. Proverbs 13, 22 says this, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the sinner's wealth is laid up for the righteous. So here it even talks about ancient 401ks. Talks about the wisdom in saving for the future to take care of your family. There's nothing wrong with investing and seeking to build a retirement account. He's saying a wise man leaves this inheritance. Now, does that mean if a man dies without a 401k or some large estate that he has failed his family? No. But it's definitely a principle drawn from Proverbs of that hard work and a consideration of the needs of your family and extended family, that is surely a noble thing. And God is the one behind it all. How do I know that? I'll just refer to two references without reading them. Deuteronomy, you might want to take this down. Deuteronomy 8, verse 18. And then Proverbs 10, verse 22. And in both those cases, it says, God is the one who enables a man to gain wealth. So God produces this knack and ability to be a successful provider for your family, to have a successful business. God's behind it all. And when that happens, you, we're being tested. Will we be faithful? To continue my advocacy of how God is not against the rich, I mean, just think about, the, and I'll just refer to these without giving references, these, these particular individuals in the Bible that were all rich. Job, Abraham, Joseph in the Old Testament in Egypt, King David, King Solomon, Nicodemus in the New Testament, Joseph of Arimathea who gave, who gave the, his tomb to, for Jesus to be laid in was a rich man. Does the New Testament beside James address the issue of the rich being in the church? Yes. First Timothy. Let's go there. First Timothy chapter 6. And while you're turning there, there used to be a website that I used to check out here and there called theglobalrichlist.com, but actually it's, it's a, a different title now, and it's, it's um, if I could find it here, it's under a different title. And it's called Giving www.giving, G-I-V-I-N-G, what, W-H-A-T, we, W-E, can, C-A-N, all those letters run together, dot com. In case you're wondering, you say, well, this is referring, today's message is not really practical to me because I'm not rich. And if that's your thinking, you need to go to that website. Because the poverty line in America for a family of four is 26,000, which when you compare that to this, the rest of the world, it's more than 80%. You make more than 80% of the world if you're making 26,000 a year. Western Christianity, the Christianity of our day and age is very wealthy whether you think you're not, you are or not. So this applies to most everyone here, I would say. I don't know everybody's pocketbook, but I would say this. I'd be shocked because the church is to be meeting one another's needs, doing good to all people, even to those of the household of faith. And there should be no one who calls this place their church home 
who is in real need. If that's the case, then our church is not being the sensitive, loving, ministering church we think we are. It doesn't mean everybody has a certain status thing, like a big screen TV. It doesn't mean that everybody has this and that that they think is important. It means, is everyone being fed, clothed, housed, or are they deficient in these areas, able to have some way of getting around and getting to work? All these concerns come into the discussion of how we ought to look at it. In 1 Timothy 6, verses 7 through 10, it says, For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. The problem is not money. The problem is the love of money. In 1 Timothy 6, 17 and 18, watch this. Well, I'm going to read this, and then what you're going to see, there's six particular takeaways that are right there in the passage, in those two verses, that will help anyone here who wants to know what, what we're talking about today, help them grasp the practicality of how you should handle your money. In 1 Timothy 6, 17 and 18, as for the rich, Timothy, in this present age, Charge them, number one, to not be haughty, prideful, flagrant in their boastful lives, nor, secondly, to set their hope on the uncertainty of riches. Thirdly, but to set their hope on God, who richly provides everything to enjoy. Amen. Verse 18. Furthermore, they are to do good, the rich, to be rich in good works, and to be generous and ready to share. Generous and ready to share. Well, James has laid that out for us now in this next section as we look at carefully at verses one through six, verse by verse. But notice in the first one, in verse 1, what he's, he, he's kind of going immediately to the conclusion. In verse 1, that you would think he would give final exhortation, and that would be the, my last point. But he actually brings the conclusion to the introduction to awaken us, and then gives us four reasons in verses 2 through 6 as to why God is angry with the ungodly rich. Notice then the first point. It says, the coming day of judgment is the concern here. Notice, come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. I mean, obviously, again, these are people who were the ungodly rich, particularly the Jews, who were mistreating those who brought them wealth. We're going to see that in the four points. But notice here, he comes out of the gate saying, come now you who are rich. It's a confrontation. Weep and howl. Think of that thought there. For the miseries, those miseries are coming upon you. It's like Jonah to the Ninevites, warning them, repent or it's over. It's like John the Baptist and Jesus in Matthew 23 confronting the, the religious Pharisees. It's, this, it has the same emotional gripping part here about the, is, is confronting the madness of materialism. It is mad. It's insanity. It's not insanity to work hard and benefit from that. It's insanity to put your hopes in money and not be rich toward God. It 
Come now then, you rich. You know, the Bible gives many examples. I'll just show you, share a couple. We'll go to Matthew 19 for a second. Jesus is constantly dealing with the rich. This is about the rich young ruler. 19, 16 and following, and behold, a man came up to Jesus saying, teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? What must I do? Just tell me, I'll do it. What do I need to do to get to heaven? I mean, there are, there are people locally that I've had conversations with that, that really think at the end of the day that God's going to weigh all the good things they've done and then see all the bad, and he's or she's hoping at the end of the day they'll have more good things than bad. It's no different than what is being said here. So Jesus says, why do you ask me what, good, what, what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He's challenging him. He says, which ones? He says, you shall not murder, the sixth commandment. You shall not commit adultery, the seventh commandment. You shall not steal the Eighth Commandment. You shall not bear false witness, the Ninth Commandment. Honor your father and mother, the Fifth Commandment. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Which has to do with Commandments 5 through 10. It's a powerful picture here. He says, the young man said, all these I have kept, what, what, what do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect then, go sell what you possess and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. And Jesus said, truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And look how the disciples respond. Well, then who could be saved? There's hope for a rich man. What is that? Repent of your sins, put your faith in Jesus Christ, and then put your money where it needs to be put in subjection to the word of God, and then go forward in joyful obedience living for the glory of God, sharing, investing in God's kingdom, being generous, or else you'll be caught up what we're going to see in a few moments with all the sins that are unique to the ungodly wretch who have forgotten God. Calvin said, John Calvin said, the heaviness of God's vengeance will be so horrible and severe on the rich that they will break forth into a howling. Now, ju now just think about this. It says here, come now you rich, weep and howl. In other words, I want to tell you, unless you make an adjustment in your life and turn from your sins, put your faith in Christ and understand you've been given a stewardship with this money you've got and you sanctify it in the service of God's kingdom, if you don't do that, weeping and howling. And I began to think, well, weeping, Jesus mentioned seven different times. Referring to hell. In that place, there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's a frightening picture. Grinding teeth, weeping and gnashing. Seven times Jesus refers to that. But that's not what is being portrayed here in James. This is like that. But the word here in the Greek is the same, weep, as, as Jesus uses. But the howling is a frightening picture. I was visiting my son, older son, this past weekend, my wife and I. And, and you know, we were talking about different things, about his experience as a Marine in Iraq. And I he was saying one time, 
And they were on a, on a mission uh, of a section in Haditha, and he said, um, one, one of their men uh, killed a young, a young man or young boy uh, from some family. It was, it was a mistake. It was a mistake that they made their unit going house to house that they killed the wrong person. And he said, yes, and then we gave him $20,000 cash to try to appease the family. But he said, I'll never forget the howling, the weeping of these Muslims. And then I thought of our dear brother, Ken Temple, and how his wife described to us the weeping of Ken and lamentations of the loss of his son how he even cried like the Iranians, didn't just speak it. It just makes the hair on your body stand up. The weeping and the howling, he says, the rich are going to face that. Now you might say, wait a minute, hell's hell. But there's an emphasis here, and he wants us to see that God is not against being rich. He's against the rich whose heart is not right with him and how they have this wealth. Either they've earned it improperly, either they've mismanaged it and how they've dispersed it, and they've beat down people and oppressed them. And in this case, there are believers who are being oppressed, as we'll see in just a moment, but then it goes on and it says here, for the miseries that are coming upon you. Some people say that's a reference to 70 AD, which was another 30 years down the line. It's coming, it's coming quickly. But if you go to Romans, Romans chapter 1, then you know, remember the wrath of God's revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness of men. In Romans 1, 18 to 32, it's, it's dealing with that whole issue of the ungodly, the irreligious. But in chapter 2, he warns of the danger of the religious ungodly. And in particular, in Romans 2, notice in verse 5, he says, But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself for the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed and he will render to each according, notice this, according to his works. You'll be judged by your works. If your works, all of us will be judged by our works. We're saved by grace, but we'll be judged by our works. Our works are either rooted and what God's produced in our lives, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it's God who's at work in you, but the will and to work for his good pleasure. It's either God who's predestined that we should walk in these things, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Either God's ordained that which he requires and he performs through us, Isaiah 26, 12. If that's the case, then we'll stand while being judged. And he'll say, come forth good and faithful servant, but you won't get in heaven and say, I just made a profession of faith, but I know my life wasn't that good in how I lived out my life, and I know I probably could have lived better in this and that, but I made the right decision. You're on your way to hell. Salvation is by grace through faith, and it's a faith that's not alone, but what saves you is the grace, and the clothing being clothed with Christ's righteousness and but the life, how could you be a Christian and you're not even seeing one-tenth of what I'm saying right now? It's impossible. There's going to be weeping and howling. He goes, for the miseries that are coming. He's referring to not 70 AD. He's referring to what's even closer than that and what is close to us today. The day of our departure from this world. What if you found out today I've got two days to live. Would you scramble to think, man, I sure didn't live a good life. I sinned so much. And that's true, we're all sinners. Or would you say, I've got two days, okay. 
I want to honor my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ by telling you this. If it wasn't for his perfect life and a sacrificial death, I'm finished. And someone said, but you gave this amount of money. And I remember you did this. All that's irrelevant. I hope you would say this. His perfect life was given to me and all my sin was placed upon him and I rest in his finished work on the cross alone. Period. That's it. I hope you'll say that because if not, You'll weep and howl forever in outer darkness. Secondly, notice the first of four reasons why God was angry with these godless Jews who were rich, who were oppressing the people in that assembly or that was gatherings in, in this being scattered in Asia Minor. Why? The first one reason is this. They were hoarding their wealth. They were hoarding their wealth. You, your riches, verse 2, your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Now when he says your riches, what's he referring to? In that culture, the riches he was referring to were your food and crops, were, were your clothing, and your precious metals, gold, silver, whatever. That's how they measured wealth. Of course, your food, the food and your crops would relate to the whole matter of land ownership, I'm sure. But notice he says, he's saying, all these things are passing away. He says, your riches have rotted. In other words, your crops rotted in the field. Your garments, which you thought were so spiffy and sharp and dynamic that you spent all that money on, they are moth-eaten. Your possessions, your investments are all corroding. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you. Some people say, well, see, the Bible's got an error in it. Gold doesn't corrode. No, what you don't understand is the coins they used in the first century were mixed with alloys and imperfections with the gold and the silver but even if it was just silver, silver tarnishes on its own. Now gold doesn't, but the point was the gold was mixed with alloys and it, became, it began to rust, get corroded. His point is what you think your worth is that you have is not what you think it is. It's passing, it's drifting, it's corroding. Look at it says in uh, in Matthew uh, 6, Matthew 6, Matthew 6, notice here two, sec two parts of Matthew 6. Verses 19 to 21. He says, This is Jesus. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy. There it is where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That's the underlying for, force behind all this. Where's your heart? What kind of, are you laying treasures up in heaven? Are you, are you hoarding your treasures? Are you completely getting swelling with your, your, your money to the point where all those things that 1 Timothy 6, 17 and 18, 
I refer to the six things of doing good and being rich in good works and generous, and all that, where those things are foreign and only when you feel guilty you partake of that. And, but are, are, you, are you really seeing the priority? It's a powerful section. Go to Luke chapter 12. This is one of the, one of the very most, I think, shocking parables. In Luke 12, verses 13 and following, someone in the crowd says, Teacher, tell me, tell me, uh, my brother, to divide the inheritance. Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. My brother's not being fair to me. I want my cut of the inheritance. It's a family feud. Jesus says, Man, who made me judge or arbiter over you? Verse 15. And he said to him, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable saying this, a land, a land of the, a rich man produced plentiful, and he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax. Eat, drink, be merry. But God said, you fool. This night, your soul is required of you. It's a frightening phrase. Right when I thought I'd live forever, have all the things I wanted and this, that. And that. He says, you fool. Tonight, you die. Tonight, you enter eternity. Are you ready for eternity? Are you clothed in the righteousness of God's Son? Have you trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior? If not, why not? Do you not see your sin? Do you not, when no one's looking, do you not see your heart and your need for Christ? He says, this night your soul is required of you and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? You can't take your money with you. you. Can't take your things with you. So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So he says here then, it will eat your life like your flesh like fire. Matthew 5 and Matthew 10 talks about the fire of hell. Second reason why God's angry, not just because they're hoarding their wealth, verses 2 and 3. Verse 4, because they were cheating their workers. They were employers who mistreated their workers. I pray that not one business owner in this place this morning could be accused of that mistreatment of your laborers. This is the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields. They hired these guys, which you kept back by fraud. You didn't pay them their wage. You ripped them off. And it says, by which you kept back by fraud are a crying out against you. It's going to come back on the ungodly wicked business owner who doesn't treat his employees right. Again, back to the whole reason why we work. Why do we work? Why do we own a business? If it's to be rich, if that's your sole focus, there's an ungodliness there you're not saying. If the motive for building a business is one by which to honor God, and by success, employ others and bless others and have more to give to God's kingdom and lay up treasures in heaven. That's a beautiful thing. But if your purpose for working is not that, if it's not to provide for your own and to take care of those in need and all that, it's like I just said, but if it's to become rich, and just pure, pure richness. 
just have more and more. And there's no game plan to perpetuate with wise investment the kingdom of God. Those in need. There's a problem. Look at it says here. Furthermore, he goes, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. Now this statement is used, I'll just give you a couple references here. Genesis 4.10 is the classic. Remember Cain and Abel? And then it says, his blood, your brother's blood has, has screamed out against you and it's reached the ears of God. In other words, your sin will find you out. You may have made it to this point by your mistreating your employees, but you won't make it ultimately. Your heart will be revealed. I pray that's no, no one here. I pray that every believer that professes God's kingdom is a, is a wonderful employer and meets the needs of many. Genesis 4.10, Genesis 18.20, Genesis 19.13, Deuteronomy 24.15. These are references that talk about this reaching the ears of the Lord of hosts. And it's a frightening statement. If you go back to James 4, we've already covered that momentarily. But in James 4, 11 and 12, it says this, Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and destroy. But who are you to judge your brother? So he's talking here about the importance of understanding that God sees everything, God hears everything, and God will deal according to his law. As the great lawgiver, he will bring justice. Maybe not in this life, but in the life to come, for sure. Thirdly, why is God angry with the rich Jews in this context? Their self-indulgence. Their self-indulgence. Verse 5. You have lived on the earth, he says, in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. Now think for just a moment. Think of the parables that Jesus proclaimed many times. But just think of, for example, one. Think of one that that deals with the whole issue of living in luxury in this life and then in the life to come he, get, he gets what he has brought upon himself. The rich man of Lazarus. Remember Lazarus? Sores on his legs, dogs licking his sores. He's by the gate of the city. The rich man passing by. Or we know the Good Samaritan story. You know, the picture, the, the priest walks by and leaves the man, and finally the Good Samaritan takes care of meets the man's needs. So you see these, these pictures of the indulgence, the luxurious living, and, and you're just immediately taken that these people obviously are totally unaware of their surroundings. The wicked rich are totally unaware of the, of the needs and the cries of those around them. They're, it's irrelevant to them. An interesting passage in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 16. It's in, in what it says in this section here, it describes Sodom and Gomorrah, which I think our culture is very much like Sodom and Gomorrah. We know what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah, Genesis 19 tells us. But in Ezekiel 16, it says this, verses 48 and 49. As I live, declares the Lord God, your sister Sodom and your, her daughters have not done as you and your daughters have done. Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, excess of food, and prosperous ease but did not aid the poor and needy. Wow. So what were their sins? 
They were overfed and unconcerned about anybody. They were consumed with their love for money. Again, this is not a slam on hard work and earning lots of money and becoming even rich. Not, not a slam on that at all. But as these things happen and you're being tested with your success, are you growing in your generosity and your awareness of those around you in need? Or are you going straight ahead, building bigger barns, focused on that, and forgetting why you even work? I don't know who gives what in this church. Never have, never asked, don't, don't want to know. But I do ask Jason a question once in a while. I said, is there more cash in the offering plates or checks? And he always says, blessed be God, 99% checks. You might say, well, what does that mean? What's the, what's the problem? I said, because that's, that tells me that people are, it doesn't mean people that don't give, some people give cash, I guess, in an envelope or something. But if they want to have it accounted for, they'll put their name on it. But to give for God's eyes only, to give in such a way that I think honors God is, is to give in a pre-planned way where you give off the top of the heap, Proverbs 3, 9, and 10. Here's what I've earned. I give first to God off the top of the heap, and then all these other bills get paid after I give to God what is his, what he expects of me as a sacrificial giving child of his not pay all my bills, and then go, oops, looks like we can't give anything to God this month. Oh, here's the 20 as the thing comes by. Well, that just, that's frightening to me. Because it says, he who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. He who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. And the Bible reminds us that it, it calls us to work hard. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it says very clearly what I've been trying to say most of the sermon today. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 and following, he says this, Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you your souls have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more and to aspire to live, watch this, to aspire to live quietly, and to mind your own affairs, to work with your hands, as we instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. I think it's a good little picture, again, of the expected hard work industriousness of a believer in Christ, focused to honor God. But think about that. It says here, you lived on the earth in luxury and self-indulgence, you have fattened your hearts for the day of slaughter. He's saying, don't you know that every day, and notice the day of judgment, as I said in point number one, is one day closer than it was yesterday. The day of judgment is moving more and more closer in history to coming. And what he's saying is, if you don't make this adjustment and repent, you might as well look at cows getting, getting fed in the field as a picture of you getting fattened for the slaughter. That's what he's saying. Fattened for the slaughter. Shocking. And lastly, verse 6. The fourth reason why God was angry with these wicked, rich Jews is he says, you have condemned and murdered the righteous person who does not resist you. In other words, people that have this mindset and worldview, they're ruthless. They're care, they could care less about treating people as a human beings and, and, and caring for them and meeting their needs. And they're murderous, really, and they're thinking. And the idea here is this. The Greek word for condemned has the idea of being condemned or a sentence being passed in a court of law. In other words, they're bringing people to the, 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 
the courts and crushing them with their power. This goes on in our day and age all the time. You don't, you don't have any money, you're finished in a court of law. You don't have any money for a good lawyer, you're in big trouble, even if you're innocent. And they come in with the power and crush, which is really a planned murder to destroy people. And they've already been doing it through they're underpaying possibly their employees or maybe having them work in unsafe working conditions or the court system. They're, in other words, the point here is they oppress people who don't imbibe their worldview. Look out for number one and destroy the little man. I'm going to do it my way and that's it. And notice here the indictment at the end of it all. It says, he does not resist you. In other words, this is a picture of a believer suffering for righteousness. He doesn't say, and he, he, and he, he fights back at you and then you crush him again. It says, he doesn't resist you. And he says, he's referring to the righteous, that is the just person. That is the person who's been forgiven of all of his sins, clothed in Christ's righteousness, made right with God. That person is being treated in a way that's horrific. And this person is, although helpless, humanly speaking, under this kind of condemnation, he's patiently, humbly, and quietly handling it all, entrusting himself to God. In 1 Peter 4, 12 to 19, it talks about suffering as a Christian. That's really what he's talking about here. And look, at I'll close with this final verse here. In James 5, notice here, verse 7, which we'll pick it up next time in two weeks, Lord willing. And look what he says. The conclusion here is then, be patient. Who? All of us. In an ungodly world where injustices are done, we should be patient and entrust ourselves to God who, who will make all things right and bring justice at the end of the day. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. There we have it. How do we respond? He who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. And then we're to call those in our sphere of influence to make sure that we don't love mammon at all, but we only love God. But yet use the righteous means that God's given us to do much good in his kingdom for the glory of his name. Let's pray. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your great mercy upon us all. You've blessed us to live in an affluent age, in an affluent country. And Lord, you test us daily and you prosper us and you meet all of our needs and more beyond all we can ask or think. Lord, help us to be those who give sacrificially, not only to the church, but to those in their sphere of awareness. And Lord, help us to be wise in our investments and seeking counsel to be better stewards of the money. But Lord, most importantly, deal with our hearts. Make us tender toward your ways, your word, your will. Thank you again for the clarity of your word, and for how you use James through your spirit to continue to guide us practically and what it means to have a faith that works. It's in your name we pray. Amen.